and we can wait a couple of minutes for people to show up. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I think we could get started. We're heading up towards the 60 attendees, which is our order of magnitude number. Uh, so uh, uh, so uh, Don was giving his uh, third lecture on amplitudes. Uh, I, I wanna quickly remind people that the first discussion session is uh, today uh, as uh, displayed in the calendar. I think it's 3.45 uh, TASI time. And uh, today, Michael and Donald will be there for the discussion. Uh, we want to thank Donald for agreeing to do it very, very, very late at night in Scotland. Uh, and, and it's only for the one time, so I hope Ho you Hopefully, I'll be awake. <laughs> so yeah, so do plan to be there for the discussion. Uh, the idea is to split the class into two parts and have you spend a half of the time with one lecture, and then you switch, and then you spend the other half of the time with the other lecture. And I guess different lectures will structure their discussions in different ways. All right, so uh, take it away. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'm gonna talk a bit about um, massless tree amplitudes in, in pure yang mills theory, uh, sort of following on from the discussion um, of yesterday. So um, now yesterday I talked about three-point amplitudes um, for you know, three-point amplitudes, including the three-point amplitudes in yang mills theory. Uh, and I talked a bit about higher point amplitudes. So I showed that uh, amplitudes where you've got all the particles of the same helicity have got to vanish, uh, and amplitudes where just one particle has a plus and the rest have minus have to vanish. That's for uh, more than three particles, um, for four and higher particles. At three points, there's a special place, which is the plus, minus, minus amplitude. Um, now, so today, uh, I want to go a bit beyond that. So um, I'll talk uh, in some detail about amplitudes with essentially two pluses. Uh, so these are called MHV amplitudes, essentially for historical reasons. Um, now I thought I, it was also worth giving you some nomenclature. I'm not going to talk about amplitudes you know, well, in any detail, but amplitudes with more than uh, uh, you know, two pluses. But there are, of course, amplitudes where you have you know, three pluses and, and many minuses. These are called NMHV or next to MHV. Uh, and then if you have more, four pluses and many minuses, uh, those are the next to next to or N squared MHV amplitudes. Uh, and this continues until you start to get uh, to the stage where you've essentially got uh, more pluses than minuses. So if you've got 
amplitude where all but two particles are plus. So in other words, there's only two minuses, uh, then uh, these are MHV bar. Uh, so it's just the, the conjugates of the MHV amplitudes. So, you know, you can start from this, so it's beginning from MHV, uh, they get more complicated, and MHV is more complicated than MHV, and squared is more complicated, uh, but eventually things just start to simplify because the MHV bar ones are just complex conjugates of MHV, so again, they're simple. So the hardest ones are sort of in the middle. Okay, so, uh, so these are, in other words, you know, A with two minus. Okay, so now, um, in order to determine these MHV amplitudes, um, at least in special case, um, I'm gonna use uh, a method, you know, it's just a simple method that we can use in this case, which I think, um, the question what MHV stands for, it stands for maximally helicity violating, but say it's just a historical name. It's not, not tremendously useful. Uh, now, uh, yeah, so the method I'm going to use to uh, talk about these MHV amplitudes is sort of, um, you know, designed to convey the general method we tend to use in amplitudes to uh, compute any kind of amplitude, you know, it could be tree amplitudes and there's generalizations of exactly the same idea for loop amplitudes. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the idea we're going to use Uh, for determining amplitudes is uh, called factorization. So now factorization is just the notion that if you take some subset of your particles uh, and the momentum associated with that subset goes on shell and the amplitude breaks up into two parts. So in other words, so suppose so some sum uh, of your particle momenta, I'll say I earn some subset of your total set, uh, a left subset. So suppose this goes to this, uh, this um, intermediate momentum is blowing up. So this L will be the left uh, subset of particles. And I have in mind, of course, that there's more than one particle here. So there's some bunch of particles. Uh, so then the amplitude can blow up. So uh, the, the full amplitude, uh, so near this region uh, has the structure that there's some blob, some tree uh, containing all of the left particles uh, and then a propagator that's going to infinity. Uh, and then the rest of the particles on the other side, I'll call that the right subset. So this propagator is carrying this uh, momentum called a P uh, and the propagator associated with uh, that internal state is a one over p squared. Uh, so on yang Mills theory, that's uh, everything's massless. So we'll propagate is a one over p squared. So this is becoming big, uh, giving you the sort of blow up. So in this region, uh, the amplitude takes the form of being uh, a left-hand amplitude, a one over p squared dot uh, propagator pole, and a right-hand amplitude. So, uh, so the idea here is on the left, you've got, if you think about this in terms of Feynman diagrams, uh, you know, you just, uh, you draw all your Feynman diagrams to get the amplitude. Uh, now, in a subset of those Feynman diagrams, uh, there's this propagator here, this P, which is blowing up. So, uh, so in the region where this uh, propagator is large, this is the only uh, subset you have to keep. Uh, and on that subset, well, uh, you're gonna draw every kind of uh, Feynman diagram you would need for uh, an amplitude of all of these left particles in this propagator. So that gives you this left amplitude. Uh, and on the right, you draw all the Feynman diagrams you'd need for uh, you know, the, the right-hand amplitude, uh, well, for this right-hand set and this, this P. So that's what's this right-hand amplitude. And of course, the, the Feynman rules would give you a, a one over P squared. And they'd really give you an I over P squared. Uh, so uh, so there's, uh, in my conventions, there's, there's a sign here. Uh, it's not a big deal. Uh, but uh, so we could look at this, you know, it's often uh, useful to look at this in the simplest possible case, right? So, you know, on phi cube theory, you know, uh, you draw an amplitude, let's say, 
let's say uh, particle one and two coming in, you know, this propagator here, I'll draw it in red. It's gone, it's blowing up. I'm interested in the region where that propagator is getting big. Uh, so, well, you know, to compute this with the Feynman rules. There's a minus IG for, for that vertex. There's a one over, there's an I over P squared, I guess, uh, on my internal propagator and a minus IG. So, now in my conventions, uh, I times A is the sum of the Feynman diagram. So, uh, in the region that uh, this propagator is, is blowing up, uh, this is the dominant diagram. So, it's I times A. Uh, and this would be I times A left. This would be I times A right. Uh, so you'd like a cancel this I against say that one. I've got that I left in that one. So it gives you that minus I. Anyway, not a big deal. There's a sign. You'll see people have conventions where there's no sign. Okay. Um, now, uh, what about, well, uh, so I just said there's a propagator of one over P squared or, or I over P squared for a scalar particle. Of course, for vector particles uh, or for other particles, propagators maybe look a little bit different, but it's still fine. Uh, so it works in exactly this form for any kind of particle, for gluons, for example. So for example, in the gluon uh, propagator, you'd have a numerator minus i eta mu nu. But uh, near the pole where the propagator is going on shell, you can write that numerator as a sum over uh, polarization vectors. Uh, so actually, let me write out the sum. So it'll be epsilon plus mu, epsilon minus nu, plus epsilon minus mu, epsilon plus nu. Uh, so uh, the propagator then would supply you with the polarization vectors you'd need to make that thing an amplitude. Because when you're drawing the Feynman diagrams, you wouldn't write the polarization vector, but, uh, but the propagator gives it to you on the pole. Okay, so... Um, uh, so there's a question regarding whether this can apply for diagrams that can be split by a single cut. So there's no assumption here. I'm just assuming that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, well, in any Feynman diagram, you're going to have some set of propagators. Uh, so I'm assuming that just one of these propagators is going on shell. Uh, so, uh, so the diagrams, of course, could be, could be more complicated. So these diagrams will be complicated tree diagrams with many, many propagators in principle. Uh, this will be another complicated tree diagram with whatever number of propagators. But the point is, there's one propagator in your, in your Feynman diagrams, that propagator is going to infinity. So it splits things into a left and a right. Hopefully, hopefully that clears it up. Okay, um, so now uh, what this means is that uh, right on in the limit that this momentum p squared is going to zero, uh, so p squared times my amplitude, uh, is minus uh, a left-hand amplitude and a right-hand amplitude. Uh, in principle, uh, I should say, actually, um, it, it's worth saying that there's a plus here. So there can be a sum over different helicities. I should have put that in, really. Let me do that. So a sum over helicities here. So helicity H, for example, uh, that's a plus. Then uh, the one coming in the other side is, is helicity minus H. Uh, so, and in principle, you have to sum over all the possible helicities uh, in, uh, in this, uh, that are propagating in this channel. Okay, now, um, so some further remarks on these propagators. So, it's very handy that at tree level, I mean, at tree level, you know, it's very easy to think about Feynman diagrams. So, uh, you can deduce properties of general amplitudes um, by thinking about uh, you know, the Feynman diagrams. Uh, Feynman diagrams always compute the amplitudes, uh, even if you don't want to do the computation that way necessarily. So that, note that, there are, uh, that only p squared poles are allowed. One over p squared poles are allowed. Like in, in a standard, uh, standard theories. So I have in mind unitary local uh, quantum field theories. And that's because these are the only poles that you'll, uh, that any propagator ever gives you. Sometimes people call this locality. So the locality is the notion that, uh, you know, forces between distant places are, are conveyed by particles propagating between them. Uh, 
So now there's a question about why do we need the one over p square, or why do we need p square goes to zero? It's because um, it's because only when one over p square is becoming big that I get to isolate the the diagrams like this. Uh, so there will be other Feynman diagrams in the theory that just don't have that propagator. Uh, so uh, now uh, such diagrams then don't have the form that they split things up. Uh, of course, for each propagator going on shell, it splits things up. Uh, and you get to study then these factorization channels. So what I mean by a factorization channel is essentially uh, a choice of this set L. You get to study uh, various different factorization channels corresponding to all of the different possible sums of subsets of momentum that go to zero. So for a complicated amplitude, there are many different uh, propagators basically. Uh, and they can all blow up. Okay. Um, now I'm going to use this to determine the four point MHV amplitude. Uh, and I'll use a method which you know, captures uh, a lot of actually how uh, people perform computations in the world of scattering amplitudes. So, so let's determine a particular one. Well, so, well, let's say particles one has minus helicity, two is minus helicity, three is plus helicity, four is plus helicity. I'm going to give them species labels. Uh, you know, you can think of these A, B, C, D as being colors or, or different species of uh, uh, vector boson. I mean, I'm talking about Young-Mills theory, so they're, they're colors. Uh, now, the method uh, that people often use is to write an ansatz. So I write an ansatz uh, that can describe the general uh, shape of this amplitude, the general form it has, uh, and then constrain the ansatz by putting in more and more information, more and more physics things I know about the amplitude. So we'll use the ansatz and things uh, we've learned. Okay, so now what do we know about uh, these amplitudes? One that I've been emphasizing is that the helicity structure is important. So uh, we need to, you know, get the helicities right. There's particles, you know, particles one and two have minus helicities. So for example, uh, if I write an angle bracket one, two squared like that, that will give me the correct helicities for particles one and two. If I write a square bracket, three, four squared like that, will give me the correct helicity for these, these two guys. So this, uh, this, this factor has the correct helicity scaling for this amplitude. Now you might think, well, you know, there are many other things you could write down. For example, um, uh, I could write, uh, well, I can certainly write, I can keep the three, four squared. I was happy with that. And instead of having an angle bracket one, two squared, I could have square bracket one, two squared. But uh, if I write that, uh, well, I can, rewrite it as follows, uh, multiply above and below by one, two squared. And then if you remember uh, some properties we had of spinner brackets was that uh, S12, in this case, it's just a four point amplitude. So S12 is angle bracket one, two, square bracket one, two. So, uh, so this possibility is proportional to this possibility. And in fact, you can show that uh, in this particular uh, case, this four point case, that uh, this is the, the most general thing you can write down. So we can write uh, is, uh, well, I'll factor out uh, two powers of the coupling. So I know there's going to be two powers of the coupling. Uh, I could factor out this uh, helicity structure here. Uh, and then there's going to be some function here. Uh, which is a function uh, of st and u. Uh, and in principle, it also carries the, the color labels. Uh, let's write a, b, c, d. So these, these color labels that are, I had there. In principle now dangling along in that function. Okay, so good. Uh, what else do I know about the amplitude? Well, I know it's mass dimension. So a four point amplitude is dimensionless. Uh, g is dimensionless. This thing has dimensions of uh, uh, mass squared because an angle bracket has, you know, or any spinner bracket has dimension of mass. Um, 
at mass to the fourth. So this is four powers of mass. So that's a mass squared, that's a mass squared. So the whole thing is mass to the fourth. So it better be that, uh, that the one over, that the F, uh, that the FABCD, so this function, let me just write it FSTU, uh, better have dimensions one over mass uh, to the fourth. Uh, so the whole thing works out to be dimensionless. Okay, so now uh, what, what things am I allowed to put in? I, I want to get masses downstairs in this function. Um, it's got to be made out of Lorentz invariants. The Lorentz invariants I have are st and u. Now, uh, but one over s squared and one over t squared, one over u squared, uh, not allowed because the only poles I'm allowed to get are you know, one over p squared poles. So I can't have one over p to the fourth pole. That would be uh, non-unitary. Uh, so uh, I could then write this f a b c d. Uh, this complicated this this function uh, some uh, some numbers uh, over s t that'll have the right dimensions. So this number c s t will then carry some color structure. I can put indices on it. Uh, I'm not going to put indices on this because I'll get tired of writing them, but bear in mind that there are indices running around here. Uh, I can also write T U. Uh, I can write U S. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I can't put anything else uh, downstairs uh, with the right dimensions without putting stuff upstairs, which should just cancel it. So this is the, the ansatz that we'll write. Um, ah, so let me see. So there are two questions about the, the poles. So, uh, so there are only one over p squared poles because those are the only poles Feynman diagrams give you. Uh, so, uh, so um, you know, and you know, I can always expand my amplitude in terms of Feynman diagrams. So I know that, that the structure of the, the poles, uh, anything that was, uh, Anything that had uh, one over p to the fourth type things, you know, so that would be a one over s squared, just something that you don't get in Feynman diagrams. It's not there. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's uh, so. This is the the sort of ansatz I'm going to have. I'm going to constrain uh, determine these these uh, unknown coefficients uh, using this factorization property. So I know that uh, that. Uh, you know, we have this knowledge here that the uh, amplitude in certain limit uh, becomes uh, a product in this case of three point amplitudes. So, uh, so let's do that. Um, well, let me just write down what the three point amplitude is. So, yeah. uh, the three point amplitude from last time. So now I'm going to need it with a propagator in the middle. So I will write it like this. So particle one is minus two of the minus in some color. Uh, there's a propagator. Uh, it better have a plus in this case. So G, F, A, B, C, one, two uh, cubed over two uh, P, uh, P, uh, so the uh, last time uh, we encountered these FABCs, I think I call them X123. Um, so uh, just the same thing. Uh, I argued the last time that uh, Bose symmetry, well, I didn't argue, I think I just told you that Bose symmetry means that this thing is totally anti-symmetric. So, uh, anyway, so just some totally anti-symmetric set of numbers. We don't actually know a lot about it right now, uh, but we learned a little bit more about it in this computation I'm gonna do here. Okay. Uh, Okay, so let me see. So just uh, some questions that have arisen. Um, so there's a question regarding um, using these ideas without knowing QFT. Well, I'm talking about yang mill theory, so I can use the knowledge I have about yang mill theory if I want. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, of course, uh, interesting to see what you can learn without uh, putting in uh, you know, your prior experience of a Lagrangian. Um, so, uh, now you might wonder a little bit about these, you know, 
uh, I guess the question regards uh, the nature of the poles. Um, you can, uh, uh, you know, without using, um, you know, Feynman diagrams, I guess, yeah, you know from the uh, Chilean Lehman representation of the only pole allowed in a unitary theory, you're going to be one over P squared minus M squared poles. So you're putting in uh, basic uh, notions about quantum fields. You don't really need to piggyback on Feynman diagrams. But um, uh, one of the easiest ways of convincing yourself that this is definitely true is if you do look at the Feynman diagrams. And uh, the question regarding the helicity structure. So, so here I've pulled out this particular helicity structure because, uh, because it's the most general thing that you can pull out. Uh, like everything else you can write, like this one, uh, is proportional to, to the helicity structure I'm interested in. So I can just uh, pick this one, you know, does the job. Um, and uh, everything else you give me at four points, I can, I can write as being equal to this times some factors like this, which are scalar factors. So they don't carry any helicity. Uh, so what, what you'd end up doing is if I, if I picked a different uh, structure, if I picked this structure, for example, um, I'd have to write a different ansatz. Uh, but yeah, again, it would be equivalent. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to then um, uh, take this amplitude uh, and factorize it. So I'm going to look at its limit in a particular channel where it blows up, where some propagator uh, uh, making up this four point amplitude can go to infinity. So, and I'll assume that the, I look at the propagator with one over S, one over P1 plus P2 squared. And that's blowing up. So, so we'll factorize in the S channel. Um, so, uh, so that means I'm going to look at uh, the limit as S goes to zero uh, of S times uh, this amplitude I'm currently interested in. Uh, one with the minus and an index, two with the minus and an index, three with the plus. Or the plus. So uh, now from my ansatz, I know that uh, this thing uh, is uh, blowing up, or sorry, from my ansatz, yes, I know there's a g squared, there's a one, two squared, three, four squared, uh, and then uh, my function f. Now I'm, I'm multiplying by s, I've got to look at this function here, multiply it by this s, take the limit that s goes to zero, so uh, so this term is going to drop out because, uh, uh, you know, uh, when I multiply this thing by s and take s to zero, uh, that just goes to zero. Now the other ones will be a cst over t. Uh, and then there'll be this term here, cus over u. But now uh, when s goes to zero, uh, u is minus t. So I'll put a minus sign on the t. So that's, uh, that's what this, this function has to do in that limit. Okay, uh, on the other hand, uh, well, it's actually quite useful to look at uh, what's happening in terms of the diagrams here. In terms of the diagrams, there's, yeah. so there's uh, the three point amplitudes uh, on the left and the right here. So this one is a one minus, a two and a minus, three with a plus, four with a plus. So the helicity of the uh, particle that's being exchanged is forced to uh, be of this form uh, because I don't have a minus, minus, minus amplitude. So this could not be helicity minus, that, that's not allowed. So there's only going to be one amplitude to be concerned about. Uh, so this thing will then be equal to, uh, so uh, I'll write the expressions for these three point amplitudes. So in fact, I think I can just grab this one, copy. Uh, and then there's the other one. Now it's maybe worth uh, putting, so I'm gonna choose that the momentum P looks like this. So that's the momentum minus P. Uh, I think this is the first time we've done this. Uh, so the minus P, uh, so, uh, so uh, on the pole where S goes to zero and P squared is equal to S, P squared is zero. So P is a light-like particle, a light-like momentum. I can write it in terms of spinners. Uh, so I can write it in terms of spinners like that. And then minus B, well, I can write it in terms of spinners uh, too, by just putting I's. Uh, so that's one, one way you can do it. Uh, uh, 
So there's some uh, potentially some signs or eyes running around here. Um, now, uh, so the amplitude then on the other side, uh, this one, so it's the conjugate amplitude of this. So there will be a G, ah, so I should get rid of that C. That's what I get for cutting and pasting. So this uh, uh, propagator, I'm gonna say is exchanging color E. Uh, and then on the other side, I guess I'll get uh, color uh, CDE. Uh, and then uh, upstairs, uh, uh, there are going to be the square brackets because it's the conjugate. Um, and then you want to preserve the same cyclic ordering of spinner brackets. So there will be um, a 4p uh, and a p3. Uh, and now if you're wondering about eyes, uh, there are some eyes here, but I had two p's uh, in this amplitude. So that gives you a sign. So there was a sign here. Uh, this one, which I've just dropped, so. Okay, um, so that's essentially the basics of it. Uh, I'm going to spend a, a moment or two simplifying this expression, um, but uh, well, what we've done here is I've constructed an equation. I've related these unknown coefficients to known data uh, at lower points. Uh, and that's always the idea that we're going to use. Uh, so, and indeed, uh, uh, for loop amplitudes uh, or for higher point tree amplitudes, essentially use the same idea. So, even with loops, you know, you have some idea of the structure of Feynman diagrams. Say, so before you do any integrals, so the loop integrand, you know, given in terms of Feynman diagrams, you know a lot about their structure. Uh, you can write an ansatz for them and constrain this ansatz by, uh, by using techniques very, very similar to this. Okay, so let me uh, answer a couple of questions. Uh, so, is that a U in the denominator? I guess it's this denominator. That was a U, but uh, uh, on the pole, so S plus T plus U, well, S plus T plus U is always zero. So on the pole, uh, U equals minus T. So I just uh, exchanged the U for a T and I picked up a sign. Uh, and then you see, this is more of a discussion, so I will leave it. Um, okay, good, so I think that's, Okay, so let's uh, then just do a, a little bit of algebraic simplifications. Um, ooh, uh, let me see, so regarding this, so yeah, so I replaced, uh, our, so there's a question, what did I do here with this, ah, with this three point amplitude? So indeed I replaced the three with a P because I have a propagating particle P. Uh, on this side, uh, I also have propagating particle P, but I have also, uh, I've taken the complex conjugate of this amplitude to flip the helicities. Um, now, uh, yeah, so say I, in order to tidy this up, I mean, the expression that we have here has certain deficiencies. It obviously has this, this propagating particle P running around the place, which isn't ideal. Uh, but this gives us a good opportunity to uh, show you some of the simplifications that you can uh, quite rapidly uh, determine using spinners. So if I take, uh, so two of my spinner brackets, I'm going to take this 2p uh, spinner bracket here and this uh, p3 and uh, simplify them together. Uh, now the reason why I want to simplify them together is that um, when I have these two spinners for p uh, sitting beside one another, I can write this as uh, well, I can relabel this uh, p as p dot sigma. So in other words, it's the, you know, you've got the momentum vector there and you can use conservation of momentum. So the conservation of momentum on this side, say, is that uh, uh, p1 plus p2 plus p, big P equals zero. So I can replace that big P there with two p1 plus p2 dot sigma on three. And then I can note that uh, the spinner of two, uh, well, I can rewrite this two as uh, P2, as spinner of P2, spinner two, you know, angle spinner two, square spinner two, and I'll get a, an angle two, two, which I will drop. So, so this term here is just zero. So this thing becomes minus two. Uh, and now I'll rewrite this P1 again in spinners. So we get the spinner of particle one twice. 
uh, and you can rewrite things like that. Uh, so you see it's these spinner products are very, very useful when you get used to them. Uh, so similarly, uh, there's another pair um, here, there's this P1, uh, and I guess the one that's left is 4P. So I'll write those as 1P, uh, P4. Uh, and now I'll use uh, the momentum conservation on this side to write this thing as, uh, well, you see that the basic thing you do here is you've replaced, uh, you replaced these two spinners uh, with the other two possibilities in the, in the problem, uh, but uh, one of those possibilities gave you zero. So here I'll write uh, the P as, it can be either a three or a four, uh, but the four will give me zero because that uh, will contract with that spinner and give you zero. P4 against four is zero. So, uh, so you will get uh, one, three, uh, three, four. Uh, and no sign on this case, in this case, because uh, momentum P equals momentum P plus three plus P4. So it's the opposite uh, sign there. Okay, so uh, let's uh, return to the questions. Uh, why don't why why don't we have explicit propagator in the expression with two three point amplitudes? Um, ah, so you might be wondering why isn't there a one over p squared here? It's just because I've multiplied across; it's there, and I've taken them in it. Um, not all the helicities propagate. Uh, so there is a sum over helicities here in principle. So there is indeed another sum. Uh, however, this term is just equal to zero because there's no amplitude for three minuses. Uh, uh, in Yang Mills theory, there's no amplitude for three minuses. So I, I argued the last time that uh, a three-point uh, three amplitude of three minuses uh, had a coupling constant, which was, uh, uh, was dimensionful, so it's not a Yang Mills amplitude. So we don't have to worry about it there. Um, uh, let's see, any more questions? Uh, could I replace P with minus P1 minus P2 to get a cancellation with P1, P and P4? You could. So I guess the question is, can I replace uh, the P here at P1 and P2? I could. Uh, perfectly reasonable thing to do. Uh, I didn't do that. Um, I think if you do it, um, you potentially have to uh, do some more algebra. But uh, yeah, it's just not the way I chose to do this. Uh, hmm. Yeah, there's further question regarding this. Uh, uh, does this mean one angle bracket one two equals, well, that's actually an interesting uh, one. So the question was, is uh, two, uh, two four uh, equal to minus one three, uh, three four? So uh, the answer is uh, yes, I think so. So this is some momentum here. Uh, so the momentum for particle two, I could rewrite that as minus the momentum for particle one, but that would kill that, so it's zero. Uh, I could also write it as uh, P2 is minus P1, which is zero, uh, minus P4 is zero, minus P3, which is this. So yes, that is correct. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, so on, is this one P, P4 equal to one, two, two, four? Uh, I, I think they're proportional. Okay, but good, yeah, so uh, that's right. So I can see you're already choosing in, you're tuning into these spinner, spinner products, uh, which is good, they're, they're handy things. Um, and I will do another example of a similar manipulation at a moment, actually, so another uh, nice example. Uh, these manipulations are particularly easy at four points. Like, there's a certain sense in which I'm slightly, uh, I'm doing the simplest example here are a little bit more complicated in general, but things are particularly easy here. Okay, now um, well, let's get back to our, our algebra. Um, uh, so I want to now uh, uh, use these, these results here uh, uh, in this expression uh, and related to, uh, to actually, you know, uh, the, the, our, our ansatz. So, um, so from, uh, from here, uh, one, two squared, uh, three, four squared, uh, times, uh, I can write this, uh, C, 
CST minus CUS over T uh, equals, um, well, uh, so I've dropped the two powers of G, there's those two Gs there, uh, but there's this color structure stuff going around the place, FCDE. Uh, and now uh, I had in my numerator, one, two cubed, three, four cubed. Uh, and in the denominator I have um, now, so uh, how am I gonna write this? Uh, so I'll write it as a one, two. So that's that one I've used up a minus sign there. Uh, and one, two, uh, there's uh, a three, four uh, from here. Uh, and then there is a one three uh, and a one three. So now, as you see, the powers here of one, two, three, four, you know, these guys, they all match. So I can ignore them. And one, three, one, three. Uh, so that is equal to FABE, FCDE, uh, one, two squared. That's a squared. 3, 4 squared, uh, uh, and 1, 3 is u. Right. Uh, that's, that's the u channel, guys. So, uh, so in u, I'll, actually, sorry, let me write that u as a minus t. Uh, so there's a t, and I guess there's a minus sign on the end of this. Okay, so, uh, so therefore, uh, well, so again, that's nice. So I had a t there, I have a t there. So uh, the 1, 2, 3, 4 squares cancel. Uh, and you relate these uh, numbers here to these numbers here. And essentially now, in a, in a sense, we're done. Right? Uh, we have, uh, we've determined, uh, you know, these, well, uh, I guess I only have one equation. You can study two other factorization channels. Let me write the equation. See, uh, so this thing is a minus sign. Uh, actually, I think I'm gonna put the minus sign here. Uh, F-A-B-E, F-C-D-E. So, and by studying the other two factorization channels, you'd find uh, two more equations, uh, which uh, you can obtain also just by cyclicity. Uh, ST, so that is going to be FC, uh, sorry, A goes to B, B goes to C, FADE, uh, and the last one would be uh, STU, TUS minus C, ST, STU, F, uh, C, A, E, F, A, uh, not A, B, D, E. So these will be the three sets of equations that you, you'd uh, uh, find. Now, one amusing thing, it's uh, slightly amusing, I mean, in the context of what can you learn from this, this scattering amplitude stuff, if, say, you don't know about the Grunge of Yang Mills theory. Well, one thing you'd learn is that uh, uh, if you add all of these three uh, left-hand sides, uh, you'll get zero, right? So there's a CST there, it cancels that one, the CUS there cancels that one, the C2 that cancels that. So the sum of these three things here is zero. Uh, and the sum of these three things, uh, well, standard formulas there is zero because of the Jacobi identity. So, uh, so the sum of these things implies the Jacobi identity. Uh, you know, so if you don't want to put it in, it comes out. Uh, and there's more general, uh, so perform analyses like this and more general theories and again discover sort of basic facts about gravity, for example, if you want to look at that. Now, um, okay, so let's move on a little bit. So what I want to do uh, is solve these. So I'm going to define uh, this as, uh, I'm going to define this as C1. I'm going to call this one uh, C2. You'll see why in a moment. And then this one here is, uh, minus C1 plus C2, because they sum to zero. So if you solve uh, these equations, so you're only gonna be able to solve, uh, you know, so there's, um, uh, so if you solve, what I mean by solving is we solve these uh, for, you know, these uh, three unknown uh, CST, CTU and CUS in terms of the, the two quantities. Uh, of course, you'll only determine them up to something unknown, uh, but you'll find that the, that the amplitude becomes uh, g squared, and two squared, uh, three, four squared times, uh, so you find that there's a minus C1 over ST uh, plus C2 over TU, 
So these hopefully are essentially what I had before. So, uh, so the, there was a CST over ST. So the C1 uh, is essentially the CST up to a sign uh, plus something, uh, some other term. But the other term uh, uh, multiplies uh, S plus T plus U. So, uh, so some of the stuff here, but it just drops out. Uh, so you're left with uh, you're left with an expression of this form. Now, uh, so you'll often see these uh, amplitudes expressed. Um, so uh, now, what I let me let me emphasize. So what I want to point, what I'm trying to emphasize here, maybe I'm not being very successful. I think uh, is that C1 and C2 are uh, the two independent color structures. Uh, there is a third color structure, but it's dependent on the other two through the Jacobi identity color structures. Uh, and that's why, um, you know, the, you know, one of these objects here is essentially a linear combination of the other two. Uh, uh, and any undetermined part of, you know, this because of these equations uh, 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 doesn't affect the amplitude. Okay, now this is often expressed as, uh, expressed in a slightly different way. Uh, so, um, so I'm going to take uh, again a little exercise in using these spinners. So I'm going to take this uh, one two squared, uh, three four squared, and divide it by st. Uh, and now I'm going to rewrite this in a nice way. So I'm going to write it as one two to the fourth upstairs, three four squared. So I have to divide by two powers of one two. Uh, and now I'll write ST in some uh, nice way. So the S I can write it as three, four. Uh, it's not exactly what I wanted. So, so S I can write as three, four, uh, three, four. And the T I can write as two, three, two, three, like that. Uh, okay, so now uh, one power of three, four cancels. Um, so I'll write this thing as one, two to the fourth. Uh, and then there's one power of one, two, and power of two, three, which I'll keep here, uh, power three, four. Um, very good. And I have left, um, so there's upstairs a three, four, a square bracket. And downstairs, I'd left, uh, so I have one power of angle one, two, uh, and I have one power square two, three. So I'll use this idea that uh, angle one, two times square two, three, uh, there's a two in common. I can use momentum conservation to rewrite that. The only uh, thing that's going to give me nothing, uh, that's going to give me anything is if I replace the two with a four, I'll pick up a minus sign. So then I can write this as, uh, Four one. So I used up my minus sign there, uh, and uh, what was left uh, on the other side was uh, four three. So these things cancel up to a sign. Uh, so it's equal to minus one two to the fourth uh, over one two two three three four four one. So, uh, so these things take on a very nice form um, and we can write the uh, amplitude, uh, the whole amplitude. So I'll write it in a sort of what I hope is a clear way. So there's the overall factor of G squared. Uh, now there's a, the color factor. So this color factor here is C1. Uh, so C1 was this particular color factor, uh, F-A-B-E, F-C-D-E. So I'll write that diagrammatically in the following way. So, So, uh, so this color factor here, what I mean by it is it's the color factor. What I mean by this C is the color factor of this diagram. So if you think of that diagram, it's like a Feynman diagram. Well, you'd say there's, a, there's, you know, there's an F at that vertex, there's an F at that vertex. You put the, you know, the right colors and you would just write F, A, B, something summed, F, uh, you know, C, D, something summed. So you'd write this color structure. So that is what I meant by C1. Now there's this minus sign this minus sign here cancels that minus sign. Uh, so one, two to the fourth over uh, one, two, uh, two, three, 
three, four, uh, four, one. Uh, and then for the other term, well, there is this other color factor, uh, which I called C2 here. Uh, so it was that, uh, no, it's this color factor here. So and if you look at that color factor, hopefully I have it right. Um, so this has the color of particle one. So I'll write a one connected to the color of particle uh, three. So I'll write a three. Uh, so then there's going to be a four. Uh, sorry, not a four. I should write uh, two and four. Uh, and then the, uh, the kinematic factor multiplying this uh, uh, happens to be, well, there's still a one, two to the fourth. Uh, and then downstairs, there is the same ordering as that uh, color factor. Three, two. Uh, I'm running out of space here. Let me give myself some more space. Uh, Uh, so that was three, two, uh, two, four, four, one. So you see the color and the kinematics uh, are working together quite nicely. Now, um, uh, before I address questions, uh, I just wanted to say, uh, make some remarks about this structure. Uh, so notice that uh, in this form of the, the full amplitude, I've expressed the amplitude as uh, some with some color factors and some kinematic factors. So I've disentangled the color and the kinematics. There's a, there's a color factor, a kinematic factor, a color factor, and a kinematic factor. Uh, so that's often a very good idea. So this particular, uh, you know, these coefficients of these color structures, so these coefficients are called, uh, uh, well, various different names, color ordered amplitudes. Uh, sometimes just ordered amplitudes or color stripped amplitudes because you have, uh, if you're just talking about uh, that kinematic factor, you have uh, stripped off the color factor and the color factor is sitting there. Uh, and also this, uh, well, as uh, I'll show you in a moment, this is general. So we can always write uh, a Yang-Mills amplitude or indeed, uh, well, we can always write Yang-Mills amplitudes as uh, color factors much like this times kinematic factors, these color ordered amplitudes. Um, uh, and the, in more complicated theories such as QCD, there is a similar idea. You know, there's slightly different color factors, um, but you can always go to a basis of color factors uh, to separate out the, the structure of the color from the structure of the kinematics. And that can really uh, help you organize the computation. Okay, uh, so question. Does the graph make more sense with two lines for the gluons a la tuft? Um, yes, th this is very closely connected to, uh, to Tuft's uh, picture and that can be, that can be a, a very useful way of thinking about it. So, uh, so we could also draw this diagram with the two, uh, let, me, yeah, let me draw uh, two uh, sort of double line notation. Uh, it gives you some insights into, into the structure of these things, which I hadn't particularly planned to talk about, but since it comes up, uh, so I could draw it like this. Uh, and topologically, uh, a useful way of thinking about that is it looks a bit like, uh, well, well, maybe I, I won't say any more than that. But, uh, yeah. So uh, you can build on this to, to, uh, to understand these, uh, some properties of these, uh, this color decompositions, which are useful. I guess I won't go into them too much detail. Um, is this only for the S-channel diagram? Uh, no. So at this point, uh, so this is the full amplitude. So this is the this is the complete story of the amplitude. So I went beyond looking at um, the. So in my my discussion here, I focused uh, at this stage uh, on uh, S-channel diagrams essentially by looking at the, this region where S was blowing up. But uh, these two equations, which you also need to fully determine the system, uh, well, at least you need one of them, uh, comes about by looking at a different channel. So, 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 uh, so this was information from S channel, so this is information from uh, uh, the T channel, and this is information from the U channel. Um, and one other question I remember yesterday, uh, that I mentioned separating kinematics and color, um, ah, 
Okay, so uh, yeah, potentially I'm a little bit late addressing this question. So I hope uh, by now it's, it's uh, somewhat clear that um, uh, but uh, in this form of the amplitude, there's a color structure and a kinematic part. Uh, the color structure and the kinematic part. So, uh, and indeed, uh, the question goes on to talk about color kinematics duality. I'm going to talk about that in some detail uh, tomorrow. Yeah, sorry, Friday. So we'll hear a lot more about that. Um, And I'm afraid I don't quite follow this question. Um, we're equating amplitude with CST factors with the amplitude with just kinematic factors. Why don't we just find the amplitude using the kinematic factors? Hmm. Yeah, maybe I don't quite understand that. So perhaps we should come back to it at the end. Okay, um, so uh, let me move on. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about, um, um, oh, okay, so one last question. Isn't it one three to the fourth in the numerator of the C2 term? It's not actually. So it's one two to the fourth and it has to be um, because of uh, uh, helicity. So it's always useful to, to bear in mind the helicity structure. So if you look at the helicity structure and those denominators, they're the same. So the numerators uh, therefore have to have the same helicity structure. Uh, so the numerator here, uh, well, again, I'll discuss this in a little bit more detail, but the, this particular numerator is is telling about the, well, is determined by the helicity structure and the, the cyclic nature of that denominator, the cyclic structure, like what comes after one, you know, is determined, uh, is related to the color factors. Okay, I'll talk about it a little bit more detail. Okay, so color ordering. Oops. Okay, so um, so I guess uh, uh, so. The idea is it's always possible uh, to separate uh, the color and kinematic structure uh, of amplitudes uh, uh, by going to you know, on the basic. You know, the, the, the general idea is uh, is just uh, you know uh, rewrite uh, so color factors usually uh, satisfy some set of identities Jacobi identities etc uh, so pick a basis of different color factors uh, and then write your amplitude out on that basis so. So you write the full amplitude out so then there will be coefficients you know the amplitude will have some you know the, the basis color structures times some coefficient that contains all of the kinematic information uh, so uh, the coefficients of the color structures Uh, then carry all the kinematic information. So you know it's 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 the familiar old idea. You know uh, you got something with many, uh, you know, got some comp some complicated thing. Well, you know, find a basis. Uh, usually it simplifies things. So now I'm going to talk about this purely in the context of pure Yang Mill theory. So you see an example of it worked out. Uh, but you can do this. Um, sorry, well, let me say pure Yang Mill theory at tree level. Uh, but you can do this for uh, for QCD. You know, it works for QCD. You do it work for loops in QCD. Uh, very handy if you're interested in um, LHC amplitudes, for example. Many gluons potentially are two loops or something like that. Uh, well, then you want to identify a color basis, uh, which is just group theory, uh, and you know the physics is contained in the the coefficients of those color structures, which you have to calculate. So that's that's the work. So, so I'll just describe uh, pure Yang mills. Anyway, the story is particularly nice in pure Yang mills. Okay, so um, I'm going to start uh, with Feynman diagrams. So, uh, as I said, 
you always know the Feynman diagrams are there, so they're often a good place to start. So the amplitude, the full amplitude, whatever it is, is a sum over Feynman graphs. I just call them F graphs. Uh, and I'll call a given Feynman graph gamma. So, uh, and, uh, and here I'm introducing really a little bit of notation. So there's a, a color factor of the diagram gamma, uh, a numerator. So this is the kinematic numerator made out of Feynman rules. It's got new polarization vectors, momenta, all of that stuff. You've got to compute your Feynman rules to figure out what these kinematic numerators are. This D here is just supposed to be the propagator denominators uh, associated with uh, that graph gamma. Uh, and the C is the, the color. Uh, so the same, you know, I have in mind the same C as I had here. You know, so the color structure associated with your Feynman diagram. So let me give you uh, just a couple of quick examples again. Uh, so the color one, well, it's one we've seen before, but repetition is a fantastic thing. So the color structure of this diagram is, well, I'll say that particle one has index A. Uh, particle two is index B. There's some color being summed over in the middle. Uh, uh, and then I'll keep a cyclic ordering, ECD. The denominator of this diagram, two, three, four, uh, well, it's just, um, you know, S12, uh, P1 plus P2 squared. Uh, uh, the, the numerator of that diagram, I'd have to compute it from the Feynman rules. I'm certainly not going to do that. Uh, so, but you can, of course, we can compute it if we want. Uh, now, it's worth pointing out uh, uh, because you know it's obviously slightly confusing, but it's it's worth noting that the that the color structure of the four point um, four point vertex that uh, color structure the four point vertex comes into Feynman diagrams, but its color structure is simple. So here I'm actually going to draw if you're going to draw glue on lines, which I frankly find very difficult. I think the only time you're going to see a glue online. Uh, so this is say color 1A, 2B, 3C, 4D. Of course, all of my other, sorry, I should say this, these lines are gluons as well. I just didn't make the wiggly because I'm no good at drawing the wigglies. Anyway, so the Feynman rule for this, if you uh, pull out your favorite quantum field theory textbook, you'll find the Feynman rule looks like, well, there's some, uh, there's a G squared, which I'm sort of leaving out. Uh, there's some potentially some factors of i, which I'm not worried about because uh, I'm only interested in the color structure here. Uh, but what you'll find is that the uh, the Feynman rule is something like this. Epsilon two. Uh, sorry, these should be uh, should be polarization vector epsilons. Epsilon one. Epsilon four. Epsilon two. Epsilon three. And then there's another term. Epsilon one. Epsilon three. Epsilon two. Epsilon four. Uh, plus two additional terms. But the point uh, I want to make here is that this is equal to this bit here is the color factor of uh, this diagram. Right. So even though the Feynman rule is uh, a four point blob, the Feynman rule of a four point vertex uh, has the structure of a sum of color structures uh, for diagrams with the, uh, a particle being exchanged essentially. So at the level of color structures, I only ever have to draw diagrams like this with three point vertices, which is a useful thing to, to bear in mind. Okay, so a couple of questions. Um, it's, looks like that's just the Feynman diagram. Hmm, I'm afraid I don't understand uh, the context of this question. So maybe it's about uh, this expression here. So my sum is over all the Feynman diagrams. Uh, so uh, for any Feynman diagram, I want to give you some idea of what these C's, D's, and N's look like. So this is the C of this particular Feynman diagram. And that's that. uh, the denominator of that Feynman diagram is just this. Uh, and any Feynman diagram, it's always easy to write down the denominators and the color factors. The hard bit is to work out what the N is. And I'm certainly not going to do that. Um, are these color flow lines? Um, are there any approximations? So no, I haven't used any, any large N type of approximations here. I think this refers to these lines here. Um, and yeah, indeed, they're, they're um, so, I mean, so, so this, this notation just means uh, uh, 
you know, think of, think of this as being a Feynman diagram, write down its color structure. So uh, that's always a mechanical thing you can do. Okay, um, now, so what I want to do, you know, and the whole uh, goal of this, uh, the, the point about color ordering is I want to uh, write out a basis. I want to express every color order, color structure you give me, every color structure that Feynman gave me, you know, from Feynman diagrams. Uh, I want to write it in terms of a basis of color structures. So now to see how to do that, um, let's remember what are the relations between these color factors. Uh, the relations are always Jacobi identities. So it's always that Jacobi. Now, uh, now it's helpful to have a pictorial idea of what Jacobi looks like. Um, so this is what Jacobi looks like. Uh, so I'll draw a color structure. So I'm going to draw a color structure here of an arbitrary diagram. So I'm going to assume that I've got more than three particles, by the way. So, uh, so I have at least four particles. Uh, now, this blob here, now let me first of all copy this because I'm going to use it a couple of times. So this, uh, this object, and the idea here is that you can have many particles attached here. I'll call the particles alpha. Uh, many more particles potentially attached here. Many or one, I don't mind. I'll call that blob beta. This is gamma, that's delta. And they can be any number of particles. Uh, and now Jacobi, uh, Jacobi just works by saying, um, so I have the same structure here. Uh, I keep these alphas uh, and this delta say, but I permute these two. So what I'm doing here is swapping this blob uh, well, I'm, I'm interchanging these two blobs, right? So the, the beta blob becomes a gamma blob. The gamma blob becomes, well, certainly not a delta blob. That was supposed to be a beta. Okay, so hopefully that's at least more correct now. Uh, uh, and then this thing, what Jacobi does is it says that this thing, uh, this combination uh, equals uh, a slightly different thing. Uh, and the different thing is, looks like this. Uh, beta and gamma. Right, so that's what Jacobi does. Uh, so any any arbitrary Jacobi you can write in this form, uh, and sort of convenient to keep keep in your head. I'll use this again uh, in uh, the next lecture on the color kinematics geology. So um, now, so the idea of color ordering is I'm going to use this Jacobi identity to eliminate things that look like that. You know, just say I don't like them, and I do like things that look like this. So, so, so use Jacobi uh, to reduce all color structures uh, to a basis, and the basis is going to be uh, this color structure. So I'll take particle one and particle n. I'm treating particles one and n especially here. And then in between particles one and n, there are just single particles. There's no, there's no, um, uh, so this will be uh, a particle, some permutation of a particle label. So the point is that there's no, uh, there's no splitting. So uh, there's no vertices uh, like that. So it's just uh, a single particle directly attached onto this line. So people sometimes call this, um, well, so let me first say sigma is a permutation. So per permutation of particle numbers, two up to n minus one. So here's an example. We've already seen an example. Uh, that was one, two, three, four. This is one, three, two, four, permutation of two and three. And people call this, uh, well, different names. So it looks like a, like a, like a hair comb uh, or half ladder. So, not a very useful kind of ladder, obviously. Well, it's very useful in this context. Um, it's also called the DDM basis after the folk uh, who, who explained its usefulness, Del Duca, Dixon, and Maldoni. Okay, so that is gonna be our basis. So now, um, how do we get to this form? Well, uh, the algorithm is simple. Uh, 
so, so if you give me any color structure uh, at all, then uh, there's two steps. So if, if the color factor uh, looks like this, if one and n uh, uh, are connected to everything else, uh, well, I guess if they connect to anything else, again, it's, uh, I'm only interested in cases where there's more than uh, three particles. So then there will be uh, at least uh, two blobs like this. If you have color structure that looks like that, then you replace it by uh, an equal color structure, which is or an equal combination, which is just one n. So I put, uh, I use the Jacobi to write this as alpha, beta, minus, and then you replace, you swap alpha and beta. So that's just using uh, this Jacobi here. Uh, so this uses this Jacobi. Uh, and secondly, uh, so if you've done that step, then uh, then there's a recursive step you just do. So you've got uh, uh, any color structure that looks like this. It's going to have uh, some blobs, uh, any number of blobs. Uh, but anytime you see uh, something that looks like this, alpha two, alpha three, we add more blobs, uh, alpha four. Uh, well, then you uh, replace that with uh, with uh, this color structure, uh, 1n, alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4. So I've just used the Jacobi to get rid of this, uh, of this uh, vertical fork. I got rid of that one. Uh, so, and then you have to subtract uh, minus alpha two, replace these with alpha three. So, and you keep going, uh, you keep going until there's no more, uh, no more vertical forks like that. So keep going till you're done. Uh, it'll always, uh, of course you always stop because uh, there's a finite number of particles. So, uh, so that means that uh, the, uh, once you've done that, you've written uh, an arbitrary amplitude in pure Yang-Mills theory at tree level as a sum over uh, a permutation of uh, these color structures. So one, so sigma of two, et cetera, sigma n minus one times, and then a coefficient. Now I'm using a different a here, which I hope is visibly different. Uh, so this A is the color ordered amplitude uh, associated with this color structure. This is the ordered amplitude. Now these ordered amplitudes have um, many properties. So there are certain of, uh, uh, certain obvious properties from the way I've described them. So for example, uh, so this is an ordered amplitude now. So A one up to N is minus one to the n a n one right because if you uh if you choose to use a basis with n at the left and one at the right well i could do that by flipping over all of these uh, color structures there's there's an f at each vertex so i just have to use the anti-symmetry of all of the f's uh, there's going to be n minus one signs uh, when you rewrite them that way uh, so and then you can identify coefficients so uh, the color ordered uh uh, structure in this new basis would be this thing. It just re is related by minus one to the n from the old color structure. Uh, there are certain other properties which are not so obvious from my description, but are more obvious if you use a double line notation. Uh, so there's a cyclic property. So uh, uh, and then there are certain other properties uh, uh, which are more detailed. Uh, so linear relationships amongst amplitudes, there's the kleiss uh and BCJ relations. I'll discuss BCJ relations, uh, I think an, an example uh, next time. This kleiss cliff ones, uh, they come from, well, physically, if you take uh, SUN times SUM uh, uh, gauge theory, you take a bunch of uh, gauge bosons in this SUN, scatter them off a bunch of gauge bosons in this SUM uh, and think of that as being embedded in SU n cross n plus m. Well, there's no scattering because the charges of these and the charges of those are, are different and this is a connected amplitude. So you will get zero. 
uh, but embedded in this, uh, that requires a certain set of identities amongst these clover or jadam cubes. Interesting to work it out. Uh, okay, um, um, one uh, other uh, thing, is, which uh, I guess I don't really have time to discuss, uh, but is that the factorization channels uh, that are present in a color order amplitude preserve the ordering. So in other words, uh, if you've got a color ordered amplitude, uh, the only poles present correspond to a, a, a cyclic sum of uh, the particles and not just an arbitrary sum of the particles. So let me give you an example of what these things look like. So, uh, so there's the celebrated Park-Taylor formula for the color ordered am amplitudes. So amplitude for A up from one up to N. Uh, so let me say that uh, I need to give some particles a different helicity. So I'll say those are minuses. Um, and then I'll say that particle I and particle J are the only ones which are plus. That's an N. So this thing is ij to the fourth, and then uh, uh, the ordering one, two, two, three, up to n one. So that generalizes the uh, the example that we uh, that we looked at here with these two. So the Park Taylor amplitude is the amazing fact that uh, that for an n point amplitude in Yang Mills theory. Uh, the amplitudes are just given by a monomial formula like that. It's an amazing thing. Um, so, of course, the full amplitude uh, is a sum over these Park Taylors with, uh, with their color factors. But nevertheless, an amazing thing. I guess, uh, so in my conventions, I guess there's a g to the n minus 2 there. I can pull out a g. Okay, now I'm not going to prove that. Uh, you can prove it, uh, uh, beautiful proof, for example. It's a beautiful proof uh, using... Uh, the BCFW recursion relations. Uh, now, the BCFW recursion relations is a systematic method that allows you to uh, exploit these factorization properties. So it's the same idea as, as we used here, uh, but it's a systematic way that allows you to build higher point amplitudes uh, from lower point amplitudes recursively. Uh, so that's discussed, for example, in uh, uh, Elvang and Huang's book. I'll refer you to that for more information. Okay, I guess that should be it for today. Um, in the next lecture, I will, uh, well, I can very briefly at this point discuss, um, I'd still like to discuss massive amplitudes, um, uh, but only at three points. I'll give you some idea of how we can use these story, the story for decay amplitudes, for example, for massive particles. Um, and uh, I'll also uh, talk about uh, an application of gravity, color kinematics, and that sort of story. Okay, so uh, maybe I'll um, start going through some of the questions in the chat, the comments in the chat, um, in reverse order, I guess. So sh should each vertex inside the cone be a blob? Uh, so no, it's important. Uh, that these, uh, so and maybe it's important to be clear what I mean by this. So this, that's one particle. I could have written it as blob, but I, I have in mind sort of blobs could be many particles, but this is definitely just one particle. Uh, so, that, so that's why I'm dry, drawing it in a slightly distinct manner. So the blob can be whatever it wants to be, but that's just one particle uh, at each, each line. Uh, can there be forks and forks? There certainly can be. Um, so if you've got forks and forks, well, you just keep going. Uh, so, so for example, uh, let me say forks on forks. Uh, so it's a good one. Um, yeah, you know, these things are fun. So I could keep going along about, on about them for a long time. Uh, so let's do, let's do that. Uh, so I can have something like this. Uh, ooh, maybe that's not what I wanted to do. Um, I can do that. Uh, and let me let me just say this is a blob. Uh, so what I would do, so let's say that's one and n. Uh, so this, so I leave out the c here. I'm just drawing the color factors. Uh, so I will use Jacobi to uh, write. Uh, to, so I'll first of all, use Jacobi to get rid of this this fork. Uh, so then I'll be left with uh, these guys. Uh, 
be the uh, gamma minus, well, that's n minus uh, one n. And now the other option from Jacobi is going to be this. That's beta, gamma, here's alpha. Uh, and now uh, I have to keep going because I haven't stopped. Uh, so one alpha. Uh, so then I can write the beta and gamma like this. Gamma n minus, so I'm looking at uh, this, this one here. One n uh, alpha, uh, gamma, uh, uh, beta, uh, and now you'd have to then uh, look at this fork, so there'll be two more terms, uh, which I won't do, but uh, but you see the method is completely algorithmic, uh, so you just keep going, uh, you know, you have to peer into all of these blobs, I mean, so you have to ask, is, is that blob got a fork in it, you know, it's got a fork, well, then you keep going until, until you eventually terminate, it's just no more vertical points. Uh, does this method get g's, factors of two, et cetera? Or do we have to compute all three point amps with Feynman diagrams and multiply? Uh, you get all factors of g, i, everything, um, if you're careful about it. But now I haven't been super careful about it. Particularly, I've been a uh, little careless about factors of uh, two. Um, now, in the world of scattering amplitudes, people tend to uh, define FABC uh, a little bit differently. So we usually uh, normalize our generators uh, to be delta AB. So normally you put a, well, in previous quantum field theory classes, you've probably seen people putting a half here. You, know, you've seen, you might have seen that. And uh, the world of scattering amplitude is frequently best not to do that, uh, but nevertheless to define the FABC so that, uh, that these, let me put twiddles on them. People often put twiddles. Uh, so that TATB is I, we put that, that I there. So you put an F, uh, we work with these F twiddles. So this absorbs various factors of root two that can be running around the, the game. Now I haven't been, I don't think I've been uh, sufficiently uh, crisp with my definitions that the factors of two have actually come in anywhere. Uh, but yeah, you get, you get everything from this. Uh, should it be angle ij to the four to square? So this is definitely an angle. Uh, the question is, did I write the right uh, helicity structure, I guess? Uh, and potentially I didn't. So I think that's a, an excellent point. Um, uh, yes, so I think you're absolutely correct and I should have done this. Uh, I think that's what I meant. So let's check, right? So, and I guess the point is that angle spinners have, um, have helicity minus a half. So if I wanted a plus there, I have to have two ones downstairs uh, like this. So that was an uh, excellent observation. Thank you for pointing that out. What about the uh, I? Do we have that one right? Well, uh, so there's, uh, 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 so I'm saying that there's a minus helicity for the I. Here I've got, uh, well, the angle bracket gives you a, a e to the minus I theta over two. So there's four of them. So that's e to the minus two theta. It's too many. But downstairs here, somewhere in the cyclic ordering, there will be i appearing twice, it'll get rid of two. So that gets the helicity for the i, right? So superb, yes, thank you. Um, does the order of deforking matter? Um, uh, interesting question. Uh, no, I don't think the order of deforking matters. Um, so uh, once you've terminated, uh, you will have a linear combination of um, of color structures, which are all independent. So they can't satisfy any linear relations amongst them. So therefore, um, uh, any given way you do this, any ordering will give you the same answer. Uh, so the point is about doing this is that you've used up all of your Jacobis. So once you've used up all the, the relations amongst the color structures, then there are no relations. You know, uh, so uh, what you get is unique. And that's an important observation, which um, particularly in this context here. So um, here I've expressed uh, the full amplitude as a sum over color ordered color structures times some kinematic object. Now it's important to note that this kinematic structure is gauge invariant. Right? I mean, you know, when you take amplitudes apart, uh, what's to, you know, normally the guts, you know, numerators, etc. These kinematic numerators I was talking about back here, 
these are gauge dependent quantities. But these uh, color ordered amplitudes are gauge invariant and they have to be because uh, the word identity means that the whole amplitude is gauge invariant, right? But the way the word identity works, right, is you replace a, an epsilon with a p, say for some particle, uh, and you better get zero. So if I replace an epsilon with a p, a polarization vector with a momentum, say for particle one in here, for sake of argument, uh, well then I have to get zero. Right? But uh, this particular, this particular, you know, for any given term in the sum, uh, that coefficient is some general coefficient in an arbitrary group. And the coefficients don't satisfy any further relations. So the kinematic thing here, this, this partial, this uh, color ordered amplitude must be gauge invariant on its own. So there we are amplitude like quantities. Uh, so in order to, another question, in order to use this to calculate some endpoint amplitude, would you have to account for all possible ways particles could blob together? Um, uh, well, um, uh, I guess uh, the answer to that is at some level, yes. Um, what I've done here is broken the, you know, so the, this color structure is, you can always do that, it's completely general. To determine these scattering amplitudes, the color ordered amplitudes, uh, well, then you need some method. Uh, now, a method to do that is to study various different factorization channels. And that's uh, essentially what BCFW systematizes. Now, it's often the case that you don't have to study every factorization channel. You just need to study a, enough of them to get all the information you need. So in the context of um, the computation that we did here, uh, the four-point amplitude uh, was essentially two factorization channels that gave the information. I wrote out all three because it was fun to get the Jacobi relation. Uh, but if you're willing to blind the Jacobi relation as pre-given information, you would have looked at two. Uh, and uh, you'll see if you, uh, if you take the time to look at the, this proof of Park-Taylor, it's possible to uh, show Park-Taylor is true by only looking at one non-trivial uh, factorization channel, uh, at, least for, at least for a particular ordering of felicities. So these ordered amplitudes are, as I said, they're ordered so, uh, so, you know, uh, whereas the previous amplitudes were, were both symmetric. Uh, so there's a cyclic ordering associated with uh, these denominators here. Uh, so therefore it matters whether these minuses are close together or not. That can make differences in these points. Um, now let's see, any further questions here? I think I've addressed- I think here. now is a good time to stop. Yeah, I think, uh, I think and I give think ourselves I think I've uh, finished a uh, the break to stretch and uh, we'll see everybody yeah. back for the next okay. lecture. So uh, we we virtually thank the the Donald again, and we'll right. see him again on Friday. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I think it's Friday. Yeah. Okay, so you get a day off tomorrow. So. <laughs> and we'll see you later for the discussion as well. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Okay.